Friday night. We're a little late, but uh, I think you had to run down and grab your drink, and I am almost out of my drink, so I'm a, I'm going to be in trouble for this next uh, episode. So well, I got to um, tell you, I only have I only have one athletic brewing left. <laughs> so if, if they're watching, this is your last chance. There you go. Right? We we talked about you know we need we need the sponsorship because. It, I'm, I'm literally down to my second last can and I only have one a week and it's on Friday nights. So I don't know what's going to happen in three weeks. I don't know. Weeks, we'll see. <laughs> oh, that's tough. That's tough. But yeah, no, let's, let's hope they're watching. <laughs> exactly. You know what's going to miraculously happen? I'm going to get like a case just at my door and I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, they're watching. Yeah. Good. Right. Good. That's all I need. I'm not, I'm not asking for money. Just, just enough to get me one a week. So I can, uh, we can continue to host the podcast. If the podcast goes dark in two weeks, it's because I didn't get my beer. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, if anyone's out there can even figure out who to talk to, because I tried to figure out who their, their uh, media person would be at, uh, off their website. It's really difficult to actually find someone to contact. So, well, maybe they'll be at the race next weekend and you can, yeah, yeah. You can talk to them there. That's so. right. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause I'll be down in Tempe and they do. I mean, they do sponsor a number of 70.3. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll certainly check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Just be like, Hey, you know, we've done like 140 episodes of this thing. And, and Ted, my co-host has, a, has one every week. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. That'd be really good. We've had some great guests. We need, we probably need to find a, a guest soon to bring on. That's always fun yeah. to bring on someone else uh, to talk with. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I'm trying to line up right now. Um, the person from light speed lift. Yep. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think we're going to try in the next couple of weeks to get that one um, set up. So that'll be good because I do want to talk and maybe next week and we'll talk. We talked about this, maybe doing something like return to run from injury or from yeah. time off. Um, I think that'd be kind of interesting. Maybe we'll save that even for the light speed people um, or do it with it. It's so uh, anyway, anyways, today we're talking about running as well, which is yeah. exciting. Um, so, you know, John, it's really you sent me this article and it's called factors influencing runners choices of footwear. Oh. And I just, I ate this article up yeah. and because, you know, now that I'm coaching and even before I was coaching, people would always ask me, what shoes should I get? Oh, totally. And John, you've done a ton of research on shoes, like yeah. a ton of research. Well, even more than a ton, if you add that thing, that's pounding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Tons, literally oh. tons of tons of this. So I mean, is this a question that you that people have asked you? Uh, just a few times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. Um, part of well, this topic is actually how I went through my doctoral program and right. carried on my research here at UNLV. Uh, but this article that that I found is, you know, I, I feel almost guilty because the class I'm teaching right now is physiology of endurance performance, and one of the things the students need to do is they need to answer a question based upon some of their empirical evidence. And I give them all different questions to choose from. And so I've got 60 students doing uh, each their own project. And part of their project is to find empirical evidence. And so each week I go through a different part that they're building for their semester project. And last week it was to identify a peer reviewed paper that corresponds to their to their question. And I just love finding, I go through the papers and I'm like, oh, I, I've never read this one. Let me go check it out. And so I really enjoy finding it. And so this, this paper was actually found by a student that they'll use in their uh, paper. And I saw it and I'm like, oh yeah, I've never seen this one before. And it's actually was just published last year. So it's pretty cool. It's really, it's really good. So basically let's talk about just a brief overview of what the paper is. Yeah. Well, the paper is basically, basically it was a survey of runners yeah. determining why they, what they, what were the influences when they bought shoes? Yeah. Ba basically, that's it. Like what, it, what influences you when you buy a pair of shoes specifically for running, right? So uh, without even reading the paper, I know we both read it. Yeah. Think about the last pair of shoes that you bought. Yeah. What was the influence that you, when you, when you pulled the trigger, when you clicked <laughs> buy on the on the on the website or you read, <sighs> what was without once again i know what the paper says but what about you someone who oh, it had once again who, had to be color right <laughs> well, but that was part of it right part of it was aesthetics like well, how it looked yeah yeah 
John, I know you. Your shoes got to be black because you you always. That's some- right. I gotta I gotta <laughs> gotta have it right, man. And you know, in all seriousness, you know, the reason why I bear a pair of shoes is because of the impact attenuation that shoes provide, and I really focus in on comfort, which corresponds to really what this this paper actually come out came out with. Um, but I want to back up just a little bit because this paper is really interesting. It was more, um, it, it was the survey approach, but they did an interview with yes. each uh, subject that lasted roughly 45 minutes to an hour. And out of that interview, they then developed some responses that were common. And I would love to see this type of work be done uh, with a bigger group of, of runners and you know at all different regions and all different nationalities as well it looks like this was done in new zealand and uh and it was like 12 runners yeah and and 12 runners but it was an intensive interview with each runner and i think that was really a cool feature uh of this paper and the other part that i liked about this paper was the subjects were typically in their 30s or older yeah which i really like and i think you could actually you know, maybe change, you know, maybe sort of uh, dive into an age factor or maybe an economic factor that, you know, you know, someone in their 40s may be in a different economic position than someone in, you know, their young 20s uh, yep. because your, your, your financial situation is different or what have you. So it was really interesting for a number of reasons. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And, and I liked even that there was because it was an interview format, there's lots of quotes. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And a lot of the quotes were things that I, you know, yeah. that were already in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, like the one on performance I just pulled up says, I can just trust the shoe on everything. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a shoe or two, like I've come across, and like, I just trust it. Right. Like, right. And it's weird that you trust yeah. a shoe. Right. Because, like, you know, John, you already uh, alluded to this. Like, what is the job of a shoe? <sighs> Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, if you think about it, like, why do we, I mean, this is big stuff. And, and John, I know you have a whole lecture on this. I know I'm, I'm, I'm holding back right now. I want to jump. But I don't in. want you to hold back. Cause I want you to answer that question to start is, is like, why do we run in shoes? So this actually brings up an interesting question of what is a shoe? Yeah. And you really have to take a step back and define um, what a shoe consists of. And in essence, you can break it down to some primary structures or some structures that are necessary to say this is a shoe. And there's a whole bunch of unnecessary structures or some secondary type of such structures that may do something else. And so this actually is part of one of my lectures that I, I, I go into on structure, function and performance where I, I link those three things. Structures are the parts that make up something. Functions are what those things do. And then performance is how well we do things. So I use a calculator as an example, believe it or not. And I say, what are, what are the structures of a calculator? Well, it's the, the display, it's the buttons, it's the case, it's the hardware, it's the battery. And you start listing all those structures. Then you say, what are the functions of the calculator? Well, they're the buttons, the addition, the subtraction, the, you know, what have you. Those are the functions. Then the performance is how well, how accurately it adds, how accurately, how quickly it, it does the calculations and things like that. And you take that example and now you start applying it to the human body or maybe to the shoe. So what are the structures of a shoe? And you can really just come up with the basic structure is some covering that's going to inter, you know, it's going to be between the foot and the ground. Yep. And then you have something that attaches that covering to the foot. And in essence, that's a shoe. So a sandal would call, qualify. Maybe a sock could actually be a shoe. Uh, but then there's a whole bunch of secondary structures of a shoe. Now you have the outer sole, the midsole, you've got a tongue, you've got laces, you've got you know, all these, you know, a heel cup. Uh, you got the insult, you know, all these other things that don't necessarily need to be part of the shoe. And so, uh, yeah, so what's a shoe? Um, I think what we go into a running store, we see a shoe there and all those shoes have something in common. And that common thing is there's something between the uh, foot and the ground. And if we go to the running store, for the most part, they're, they're designed 
specifically to be raining. Yeah, yeah. Right, and there's obviously like, a, we, we know it's obvious, right? There's lots of different designs for shoes, right? There's mm -hmm. shoes for walking, there's shoes for playing baseball, there's shoes for um, hiking, there's shoes for soccer, there's shoes mm -hmm. for every, there's different shoes for everything. I mean, I, I got cycling shoes, you have cycling shoes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If you live in Canada, you may have a set of curling shoes, you never know, right? There's bowling shoes, there, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of shoes. So, I mean, and, and I know you, I'm probably surprising you on some of the stuff, like, but what makes a running shoe a running shoe versus all those other things? What are some of the common characteristics? Well, so this then gets into some primary functions and secondary functions as well. So what is the primary function of a shoe? And this is where you really need to take a step back and, and, and really sort of consider those primary functions. And, and for the most part, running shoes are built around the idea of protecting the foot and protecting the body in some way. That was you know, some of the initial primary functions. I think now when we start talking about super shoe, there's also this idea that the primary function is to aid in running performance. So you're right. able to run faster uh, in, in a, a, a shoe uh, designed for running. And so if you take those two as primary functions, there's a whole bunch of secondary functions too. You know, maybe it's to control certain movements or maybe it's to, you know, stamp out a fire in a camper. I don't know, some crazy, you know, maybe to, you take your shoe off and it becomes a weapon. Who knows? It's, <laughs> uh, you know, all sorts of things. But the primary function of a shoe typically is considered some type of protective mechanism uh, in running and then also some type of uh, structure equipment that's going to aid in performance. Right. And in this case, performance is running. That's right. And that would be, and that's why you would have a, I mean, you can run in your cycling shoes. We all do it in transition, yeah. Yeah. but it doesn't make a great running shoe. You can run in hiking boots, but that hiking boot doesn't, that means it's going to be too heavy. It's not going to actually help you uh, to do that. So you can do things in other shoes. You can run in sandals, what have you, but, um, but those sandals may not be the best shoe for you to protect your foot or to uh, aid in performance. Awesome. Okay, so um, the, we're going to move on because this yeah, is there's I a know, lot of stuff you're, there. You're, and, and, and John, John, what I'd like to do honestly is one time I'd like to actually let's have a shoe. Maybe you, you have a cutout of a shoe, right? Uh, I don't. I, 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 I have it down the lab. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe bring that in, and we can talk about yeah. the. You know, the you know, because you mentioned a lot of like the terminology or the anatomy of a shoe. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we should do. Um, at another podcast on is actually going through the we could do that the, yeah. the function of each piece of the shoe because actually every piece serves serves a purpose. That's right. Structure, function, performance. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about um, when people in in this paper, uh, you know, when they talked about you know why they chose a shoe and some of the categories. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll just I'll just give you the category. So. And I think most people can kind of think about these things when they thought about the last pair of shoes that they bought specifically for triathlon. So brand and model. Yep. So there, a lot of people are very brand centric. Uh, style and other specifications. Performance. Uh, comfort. To modify, the, uh, or, or to modify their gait. Those are kind of the, the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, and modifying the gait, I think, had to do something with like, protection of injury even or mm -hmm. prevention of injury yeah. so um out of those things uh i don't know about you but i'm all about style oh nice i like it i know you I, wear two different types i do of, two different color shoes i do because the style is more important to me i would rather look good and be a little slower <laughs> right and have a little less comfort but look good that's just me yeah yeah i don't believe that for our people <laughs> yeah <laughs> But it does play a role, right? Like, yeah. if you think about it, like, oh, yeah. like you're not gonna, you know, rock a pair of like ugly looking shoes. Yeah. But the funny thing to me is the shoes we're wearing now. If we would have been wearing them 20 years ago, they'd probably be like, "Oh, those are ugly," mm -hmm. right? Because styles in shoes change, just like clothing styles change. That's right. And so it's an interesting thing when you think about purely style. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at, you know, some old race photos. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I used to run in those shoes. Those are kind of, those are kind of ugly. But at the time, those were like, you know, those were stylish. Yeah, yeah, right. right? Um, and it's, yeah, to me, that's a, it, it's an interesting piece. 
Um, and then I was, I'm less concerned about the style, for example, when I'm with my training shoe than my racing shoe. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but I don't, I don't disagree with you at all. I think that's actually a factor that people do pick. And I don't, I don't, um, diminish the importance of that. No, I don't either. It's important. Because there is a lot of value in, um, thinking that something is going to help you. And we've talked about this psychological aspect. I mean, we call it placebo effect, whatever, but sometimes if you believe something's going to work, it can actually aid performance. Absolutely. Yeah. And so especially, even, especially if, it, if you add a little comfort to it, right? Yeah. So yeah. Can, or even not even comfort, but if it feels, uh, mm -hmm. feels faster. Yeah. Right, right. Or feels right. more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, that adds to that. It yeah. might not even. It might not be faster, but if it no. feels it, or if it once again, like, and and that's the psychologic thing that goes on to this. So psychology of this plays a big role. Oh, totally. You know, I've got special race gear, yeah. and I don't train in my race gear. I'll, I'll do some stuff, but I don't train in my because when I put you know my wheels, my race wheels on, when I have my race helmet, when I have my race shoes. And my race kit that uh, i'm wearing those on race day because th those are special and uh the, and and that mindset does actually matter and so i don't i don't diminish the importance of if someone goes in and says oh i want those color not this color that's yeah. fine that and that's important I, I have no 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 uh qualms with that at all the only problem ends up being if the if that color is not like comfortable or effective yeah, right. or can create injury. Right? right. Right. So as we've talked about on the podcast before, I spent a lot of my career working in youth soccer mm -hmm. and I worked, I'd say 70% of the time with, with women in youth soccer mm -hmm. and I'm not, not to discount women, but um, they wanted like the colory shoes at the time. Yep. Like, men at the time tended to stick with white and black and, mm -hmm. you know, women wanted like some brighter, the, the pinks and, some of the yellows and so like that and they would honestly go in shoes that had they had no business being in but they looked good that's right and i you know it, it created problems for me as an athletic trainer having to deal with their injuries and their blisters and and all and i'm like this is not the shoe for the number one for this surface mm -hmm. yeah and it doesn't fit you mm -hmm. and there's nothing I used to hate more than all these kids that I used to work with. Oh, I got to break the shoe in. I'm like, you're not breaking in the no. shoe. You're breaking in your foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's a problem when actually style becomes uh, a negative impact. Yeah. Right. Cause like for us, let's say, you know, for me, for example, you know, I wear the two different colored shoes. They're the same shoe. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like I like, Oh, well, one is this brand and one's this brand. They're the same shoe, just different colors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do pay attention to like, like the fit of the shoe and the comfort of the shoe, mm -hmm. right? Style, you know, I, I might choose out of the five different ones, the one that I think is like the coolest or maybe matches my kit the best. Yeah. But like, that's, to me, that's secondary, but to a lot of people, it's not, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yes. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add one more piece to the style. So, and I'm just gonna tell you an, an anecdote. So this happened at, um, at UNLV. So I'll just, I'll, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw some people under the bus. Sorry. Because, you know, I'm sure that UNLV track and field and cross country people don't listen to the podcast, but mm -hmm. if they do. This happened. Oh, it's got to be 10 years ago now. And I was helping, you know, I've always kind of been a, a consultant to the athletic trainers that are working mm -hmm. at UNLV, especially even my former students. And this former student, she made an appointment with me and she's like, Hey, Ted, I need help with this student athlete. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going on? I can't remember the exact injury. It was something with an Achilles or a heel or something. And so we brought her in. I looked at her, did a full assessment of her, got her on the treadmill, got her running. And um, this girl was, um, I can't remember if she's a real high arch. I think she's a really, had a real high arch. And they were in some kind of motion control shoe. Mm hmm and the whole team was, this was a team issue. Everybody had the same shoe. Right. And I'm like, this shoe is causing her the problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but the whole team has the shoe. Yeah. I'm like, you're trying to tell me that all 30 kids need the same shoe mm -hmm. because that doesn't seem right in the running world to me. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 this kid is the one that actually the shoe is causing the negative problems. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, we ordered um, a different shoe and 
a, like this girl was hurt for like six months. Yeah. And we changed the shoe, did some rehab. And like within a couple of weeks, she's pain free. Mm-hmm. And the you know, part of the problem is that she's a college kid. She didn't have any money. She, she didn't buy the shoes herself. She just got what the team gave her. Mm-hmm. I think we need to be careful with that. And we see this in professional athletes all the time with sponsors, right? It's like, well, I have, the, I have this sponsor or this, you know, this style or this, you know, yeah. this thing, but it's not the right shoe for them. Right. And I think that is, that is a thing that we need to be careful, especially with style. No, I love it. So uh, that, that sort of ties in with the question you asked me before, do people ask you what's the best shoe to run in? And, and I always get that question. And the answer I always start with is the best shoe for me is not going to be the best shoe for you. Exactly. Necessarily. And that's exactly where your, your anecdote goes. And, you know, the, the way that uh, I look at, at and others look at what's the best shoe for a person, it's really based on three main factors. One is the morphology, what, how the person's built. Yep. What, is the, what is their, you know, uh, how, how big is their heel? How big is their forefoot? Uh, how do the movements of the bones work together? So, you know, the morphology of, of the structure of the person, uh, what does that look like? It's also, you know, what's the best shoe for a person is going to be based upon, oddly enough, experience or type of running a person does or how fast they run. Because yep. not, you know, uh, someone who's running a 430 mile may not need the same shoe as someone who's running a 10 minute mile. And, and vice versa. Uh, and so that's uh, really an important factor when you're looking at shoes. And then the other part is the biomechanics of, and I don't mean to be so siloed on, on biomechanics, but really it's how the person is generating force and the movements that they have that correspond with the shoe. It has to match up. You know, I'll just use an extreme example where if you take someone who um, runs with their rear portion of their shoe hitting the ground first, we would call that a rear foot striker, and put them in a shoe that's designed for forefoot running, that's not a good match. And so regardless of, you know, whether or not you should be a rear foot striker or forefoot striker, midfoot striker, it doesn't matter. But if well, I mean, that matters, but for this, this part of the shoe is important is you, you have to match up the way the shoe is built with the way the person moves. So it's those three factors, so morphology, well, I, experience, and, and uh, movements. And I, and I couldn't agree more with that last statement is, is people don't even take that into consideration, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people, like even in this, no one, no one took that into consideration, really. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, their running style. Right. Right. And, like, you know, and I would take it even the other way. Like if someone's a four foot striker and they have a, a big, you know, a big yeah. drop in their shoe. Yeah, they don't need thick, it. <laughs> and a big thick yeah. heel. Not only do they not need it, yeah. what ends up happening to their biomechanics in their ankle, knee, and hip, mm-hmm. right? Because they're now, they're to, to continue to land forefoot, they actually have to be even further up on their toes, basically, mm-hmm. right? And there's there's more force being generated, in particular in the Achilles tendon, and um, even in, you know, tibialis posterior. And, mm-hmm. and, and, I mean, there's a lot of pieces that go into this. Yeah. And they may not understand that because once again, we get marketed to, mm-hmm. right? Well, you know what? The breaking two project and, yeah. you know, hey, I got to be in, I got to be in the alpha fly because it's the fastest shoe or the vapor fly. Right. But is it the fastest shoe for a four foot striker? Yeah. Right. Going once again, like you're saying, going, running an eight minute mile. Oh. Yeah. Not a four foot striker going, you know, a 425 mm-hmm. mile. Yeah. And all of these factors need to be taken into, Nick, taken into account and it's funny to me like that was not taken into account in this survey yeah right but and what's interesting is and what i took from the survey was that comfort factor got really kept coming back into play with uh with a shoe and and uh it, we can, and it makes sense i mean you're if you're not comfortable you're not going to want to run in that shoe or it could cause like you talked about blisters but what's really hard as a researcher it's hard to quantify what comfort is and what, what factors go into play with comfort. Yeah. Because some people will get into a really soft shoe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, that's comfortable. Right. Or even, uh, we had a, we had a grad student, uh, it's gotta be, I don't know, seven years ago now, six or seven years ago. And they did that study with the, the remember the Nike free. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, right. 
And the, the, the takeaway, he wanted everyone to run 150 miles in them. I was one of the subjects. Yeah. And I think I made it the longest. I made 120 miles. I'm like, I can't run in these anymore because they basically fell apart. I'm glad you mentioned because that was something I was going to mention in terms of what shoe should you use. That's going to change over time. You know, as you age, it's going to change with experience. But also the shoe you're running in, it changes um, its structure in essence, or it changes its performance more so the more you run in it. It can change its comfort too, right? So that yeah. shoe in the beginning yeah. was very comfortable. Yep. Yeah. Like the first 50 miles, I'm like, oh man, this is a comfortable shoe. Mm -hmm. But then at about 100 miles, I'm like, ooh, this is not that comfortable anymore. Something's changed within the shoe or mm -hmm. changed within my body. Yeah. And it wasn't very comfortable. And, and like I said, most people couldn't get it past 100 miles in that shoe because something happened with the shoe and yeah, the shoe right. changed. Um, so I think that that does, so comfort's a, comfort's a really interesting one. So John, let's say we were going to design a study and we were going to, bring all sorts of different people and all sorts of different shoes. How would we actually measure comfort? It, it, I would have a, a subjective scale and you end up putting this, you know, it's uncomfortable over here and comfortable over here and have the mark where it is. I sound, it sounds terrible, but that would way, be, yeah, that'd be the way to do it. And then I would do a bunch of measurements and then try to see what measurement corresponded with where they marked. But, you know, the comfort, running in one pair of shoes on Monday, it may be different on Tuesday. Yep. And because of what we're doing, you know, in between the times that we're running. And uh, so it, it's, it's hard when we're, when we're dealing with such a subjective um, measure, but that subjective measure is really important. Yeah. Well, and I think comfort is, I mean, comfort has to be like, especially for triathlon, uh, especially long distance triathlon, if your feet aren't comfortable running, you know, yeah, yeah. you've been out there for in an Ironman, you, yeah. you're already on, you're on hour six and a half, seven, by the time you get to the run mm -hmm. and you're going to put on shoes for 26 more miles that aren't comfortable. Right. I'm telling you, like, that's probably in an Ironman, maybe the most important for most age group triathletes is like putting on something that actually feels decent at that yeah. point. Well, and, and to your point, you know, comfort standing in the shoes in the shoe, shoe store is different than comfort when you're running and different when you're running at the end of a marathon or end of an Ironman or half or whatever. I mean, that the comfort uh, rating may be different in all those situations. So I always tell people, yeah, you know, if you go to a running store and you can try the shoe out and if they had a treadmill in there, great. If they let you run over ground, even better. But then don't be afraid that if you run in the shoes for a week and all of a sudden they're not comfortable at that point, don't be afraid to go back to the store and say, hey, what's, you know, or, or buy from a store that has a good return policy or exchange policy, because sometimes you don't know right away if the comfort is uh, is going to be sustained over a 10K or, or, or longer. I've never finished a long distance triathlon and didn't want to take my shoes off. Wait, say that again? I've never finished a long distance triathlon and didn't want to take my shoes off. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they're not comfortable that. at that point. Like, that's so you, true. <laughs> like the, the first thing I really want to do, like once I kind of calm down, have a little drink or whatever, I want to get those shoes off. So that's, that tells you something. Maybe they're not very comfortable. They, well, they're, they're, they're comfortable for everything else, but that's after funny. five and a half hours, they're not so comfortable. Well, that's funny because a lot of times I, I will purposely not take the shoes off because I'll be like, I'm not going to want to put them back on and I don't have anything else to put on right now. So <laughs> yeah, I always have a, you know, I have a go bag hidden somewhere or my yeah, wife yeah. With some sandals in because I'm telling you, I don't want to be in those shoes. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, talking about design and research study, that's a study that I've always wanted to do. And there's been little pockets of this work done, but doing even a foot volume measurement yeah. before a marathon and at the end of a marathon uh, would be really, uh, really uh, informative. And then I like that idea of adding on this comfort scale uh, in the beginning and at the end as well. So maybe maybe we can uh, drum up some some uh, research in that area. So let's talk about brand and model. Yeah, uh, I'm going to read the so one of the basically the, the part of the studies basically said runners expressed being frustrated when models are changed and updated by manufacturers. We've all had this issue, right? To avoid this problem, one participant admitted to buying 10 pairs of the same familiar shoe before the manufacturer changed shoe model. Uh, I've done not 10, 
I've done four. Yeah. I've, I've never four. done 10. Yeah. It's a real thing, right? When, yeah. And, and I've scoured eBay for mm -hmm. shoes because yeah. they, I just can't, they don't make them. I, yeah. I just can't get them and find, oh, I got one. Okay, good. Like, um, that's a real problem for people, um, especially when they, you, because people fall in love with the shoe. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've had this happen so many times where I found a good shoe, I'm running it well, and then I go to buy it again and they've changed models and, or they've changed something in that model that it's no longer, it may be the same model even, but yeah. it's a different set of structures in that shoe that wouldn't work for me. And then I have to scour the internet to find the previous year's model. And then I try to buy multiple pairs at that point saying, why didn't I do that before? <laughs> uh, it's a, it is a problem. It is a problem. And, and the other thing is, is, once again, with brand is once again, we're marketed to all of the mm -hmm. time. You know, um, when I got into triathlon, um, you know, obviously it was after you, but Asus were probably the number one brand yeah. mm -hmm. in triathlon. And then things kind of switched to Hoka, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And then things obviously have switched to Nike mm -hmm. and there's like this constant like evolution yep. of what is like thought to be a good triathlon shoe. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very much like marketing driven, right? Yeah. And somewhat, you know, performance driven, but, but it's performance through marketing more mm -hmm. than it's, you know, testing an individual person's performance. All right. Yeah, and this is something when you get asked that that question, what shoe is the best shoe? I always include in my answer, you cannot be brand loyal. Yeah. None of us are making money off shoes. Now, if you're if you're getting paid to to run in a pair of shoes, that's different. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then at the same time, if you're that good of a runner and there's a better shoe for you, then I don't think it's the, you know worth the dollars and cents. Uh, that you're getting from from a sponsorship at that point, but we can't be brand loyal, and it's hard not to be because oh, I've always run in this shoe, and uh, but you got to try some other brands because there may be a better fit uh, for you, something that's more comfortable or performs better. And so I, I, I really advocate trying different uh, types of shoes. Even okay, if you want to stay within the same brand, try different models, yep. and. Uh, and, and see if there, you know, if, if a different model actually ends up being a better shoe uh, for you. But you can't, you can't be brand loyal or model loyal. Yeah. You know who the biggest fan of that is? Is my dad. Oh yeah. He's got the same size shoe foot as me, and I'm always buying new shoes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, there and, you go. <laughs> and like he gets some really good shoes that I've only ran like 20 miles, and like, well, they, these aren't, these aren't good. I'm like. You're the only like retired guy. He's like 77 years old walking around in like $250 carbon yeah. plated shoes. Just so, you know, because what am I going to do with them? Yeah, like, I, I've decided that they're not, you know, they're not good for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, he's super excited that I do that. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. Yeah. And, and I think that's a good message in that it's all often easier to know when a shoe is not going to work for you than yep. when a shoe will work for you. And any sharp pains, any hot spots that you have in the metatarsals or maybe in the heel, any hot spot that you're feeling during a run, you probably got a wrong shoe and it's not the right shoe for you. And don't, don't mess around with, it. don't say, Oh, like you said, don't, don't try to break in the shoe because the shoes right now they're, they're not, they're not leather based anymore. And exactly. so you really don't have a break in period. Uh, you do have some periods where you got to figure out your lacing and making sure that the laces are, are you know, tight or loose in certain spots. But once you work through that part, then uh, you, re you really should not have any hot spots or any sharp pains, not only in the foot, but up in the knee or maybe even in the hip region. And so often it's easier to say this shoe does not work for me than, uh, than figuring out the right shoe. And, you know, and, and John, I didn't really want to go down this road too much tonight, but just a, just a little bit down this road, there's very little evidence, even though I mentioned the one girl, um, that the shoes are the cause of injury or the shoes will solve the injury. Yeah. But you are absolutely right. If that shoe is causing you pain, that's not the right shoe for you. Yeah, yeah. Right. But just because you have a history of like, let's say, plantar fascia issues, 
the shoe is maybe a component of it, but it's not the component of it. That's right. You know, and and I know this happens with people, especially when they have chronic injuries, they just keep trying to change shoes all of the time. Mm-hmm. But once again, if the shoe feels comfortable to you, mm-hmm. it probably is not the shoe that's the problem. If the shoe doesn't feel comfortable, it might be the shoe that's causing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, this is this leads into a whole nother lecture that I love to giving because the, the other takeaway message I give when we start talking about shoes is the shoe often gets too much credit yeah. for preventing injuries and it often gets too much blame for causing injuries. And so if we look at the running running injury statistics from back in the 60s and 70s, where you know this is right when the shoe was really start running shoe was really being developed. The running injury statistics are almost the same today as they were back in the 70s. Yeah. It's knee, the knee that's most likely going to be hurt. You know, it, it, it's these very typical impact driven uh, injuries. And there's been a lot of good work. And another student in another student project found some work done by Alan Hurljack, which is uh, someone I worked with in the past when I was up at Oregon. And he actually came out with a a paper where he talked about the main cause of running injuries are training errors. Yep. Not sure that sounds odd, but it's the training. It's like the person ran too much. They ran too fast. They did ran on too different of a surface that they weren't ready for. And that caused the injury. It wasn't. And and at that, you know, that training error can it's that's not a fixed amount of error. It's obviously going to change depending on, on what kind of training you're doing. But in essence, it's the person making the wrong choice. It's not it's not the the equipment. And I, I would add that, you know, into that, if you're in a shoe that's maybe a little bit better for you, mm-hmm. you might have more yeah, yeah, leeway, yeah. All right? All right. Right. Well, that, that breaking point might just be a little bit different. That's right. But that's the training error is that you exceed that. Exactly. You see whatever the capability is, and you've gone too far, or you've gone too fast, or you've made too much of a change, and and all of a sudden that uh, you've exceeded that capability, and now you're getting injured. Yeah. No. It's it, you're 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 exactly right, and that's everything I read, and you know, obviously, I teach a lot about this too in yeah. in in our injury uh, classes. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. A lot of people blame the shoe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, really, you're going to blame the shoe. You're the one that ran 30 miles a week, every week. And then all of a sudden you got a big race come up. So you decide I'm going to run 50 miles. Yeah. 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 And it's the shoe's fault. Yeah. Right. Right. right? right. It's not. And yes, you change the shoe about the same time, yeah, yeah. but it's not the shoe's fault. It's you're right. It's a training error. And, yeah, and, and, and yeah, this is a big where, part. Yeah. This is where we end up becoming brand loyal sometimes is that, we start running and we're running on a pair of shoes and, and maybe the time between injuries is longer, but it may be that we've also changed something else, or maybe our weight has changed, or maybe we are running at a different season or, you know, like you said, different intensity based upon uh, what races we have come up. But then sometimes our brain gets stuck on that. Oh, it was the shoe that actually caused that. And in reality, it probably wasn't the shoe. But I do agree with you that uh, certain shoes do give you a different amount of capability before you get injured. And I think this is why we have, you know, so many different styles of shoes right now. I think one of the things that that's done is it's given a more broad range of people to be able to take up running uh, in a way that that they can minimize the risk of overuse injury. Yeah. And, you know, and and I'm glad you brought that up because that was that was an area that I was going to go into is is with the new foams, mm-hmm. the PBEX foam, um, people are actually, what I'm reading, are able to actually run more miles yeah. without getting injured. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually allowing for more, once again, allowing for training errors. Yeah, right, right. right? So once again, more leeway mm-hmm. compared to, you know, even once again, not even that long ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, we were still in, in the, more of the minimalist shoe yeah. mm-hmm. right and the errors in your training i think could be less mm-hmm. i i love that it's the margin for error uh, yeah. is changing a bit i like that yeah yeah so uh, another area that they really talked about and i think this is something that 
you know, you and I are concerned with, and a lot of triathletes are concerned with is performance. Yeah. Is this shoe going to make you more economical? Right. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, and we've talked a lot about that. You know, some, some of the testing that I've done on shoes personally, it matters, right? Like yeah. if, if a shoe, once again, like, you know, I know the marketing, if it's 4% more economical mm-hmm. and it, you know, it checks the other boxes. Well, that's a big deal. Yeah. Right. right? Um, I would even go so far to say, especially for shorter races, mm-hmm. performance might trump everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Cause even if it's not comfortable, Right. If it's like, you know, it's a sprint triathlon, right? I'm only going to be on that shoe for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. If, if it's the fastest possible shoe, because we used to do this, like, we, you know, you had racing flats, right? Yeah, that's right. And you'd only wear them in your 5K, maybe your 10K race. Yeah. You, you mm-hmm. Maybe you trained in them just a little bit on the track yeah. and you brought them out once again, your race shoes. And they weren't comfortable, mm-hmm. but they were fast. For the, at the time, they were fast because everything was about weight. Yeah. Actually, right. right and so performance does matter but y- you were very rarely see like an age grouper especially wearing those in an iron man mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? you might see some of like the pros you know, professional yeah. athletes wearing something like that in an iron man but it's interesting how that um you know what a performance shoe is has also changed mm-hmm. but people are really concerned about it even people that are not running that fast mm-hmm. like still like hey i want to get to that finish line as fast as I can. Yeah. Yeah. And so in a 70.3, if they're going to be finishing in three and a half hours or, or whatever the case may be uh, on the run or two and a half or one and a half they're everyone's still trying to get there as fast as they can. That's right. And yeah. so yeah. performance matters. It does. And uh, you know, the ability to run faster is part of that, you know, primary uh, functions of, of the shoe that we talked about. And so you do want to find that shoe and it does come down to a lot of weight. Uh, and a lot of times our racing shoes have less weight and yeah. therefore they may not hold up as much uh, for a training shoe. Um, but then there's the other structures that have been added to the shoe that uh, seem to be able to, to help with run performance. Like we've talked about the carbon insole and what have you, and the foam even uh, may be a good thing for, for performance. And so that, that, uh, you know, you got to find this shoe that's comfortable, yep. that fits you, that is helping protect you from injury, but also uh, aiding in, in performance. That's a big ask. No, you, we're, we're really asking a ton, right? But if you think about it in running, that's really the only piece of equipment we've got. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, some people, maybe they think they're socks or something, but really, I mean, that's it. Right. And so people put a lot of stock into those things. And, and you, you already mentioned, we have such a variety available to us right now. I mean, yeah. a virtual cornucopia of shoes yeah. out there. There's no reason you can't find a shoe that can do all of those things for you. It's just overwhelming. And uh, it can be expensive too, like you talk about, it, because sometimes you can't return shoes, but yet it's not the right shoe for you. I've got a bucket of shoes down in my garage. And yeah. My wife keeps wanting me to get rid of them. I'm like, no, I can't get rid of them. I got to do something with them. You got to find some of the same size as you <laughs> trade. I paid so much for them. I got to do something, but it, it can be expensive to find that right shoe. Um, and it changes too. It changes with how, you know, how we're running. So it's not even the same shoe that's going to work this year may not be the same shoe that's going to work for me next year. Yeah. So John, this actually happened to me like literally a week ago. So a person that I'm coaching, she's like, I'm not going to buy a sh- pair of shoes until I talk to you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Yeah. But what I'm not going to do is tell you what shoes to buy. No, you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you what I use mm-hmm. and you might want to try them, right. but they might not be the answer for you. Mm-hmm. And this is the same answer I used to give the soccer kids and the parents because they would ask me too, right? They would typically ask me after they were injured, but they would, they would ask me and I would say, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to a running store, or this case was a soccer store, and I want you to pick out four or five shoes that you like the style of. Mm-hmm. The style is important. We talked about that, right? Yep. And then I want you to try them all on. Mm-hmm. Just walk, just just walking. Are they comfortable? Because if you put the shoe on like it's pinching here or it's a little tight here, mm-hmm. get rid of those, and maybe you got two or three pair left. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to run in them. Right. 
once again, if they can it on a treadmill, um, this didn't work in the soccer world because you can't run on a treadmill in the soccer shoes, but the same thing, like if the store will let you go, try them on on some grass or some turf, right. try them on, run in them. Are they still comfortable? Check, right? Um, and then checking for performance, there's lots of ways to do this. And we talked about this before, um, like just getting on a treadmill and looking at, you know, setting the treadmill at a certain pace and looking at your heart rate. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you compare this shoe to this shoe, if it's the same pace, but a higher heart rate, it's not as efficient of a shoe. And so you kind of check all those boxes. And if you keep checking those boxes, eventually you'll find the shoe for you. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of unfortunate in the, it's kind of today's day and age, a lot of people, they just order from the internet. Um, And I do the same um, because a lot of the shoe stores don't have all of the shoes that are, that are out there. And I get it. Like, I'm sure it's quite expensive for the shoe stores to have these, you know, race shoes and carbon plated shoes. And even like the, you know, the, you know, the, the Nike concept stores and stuff, they don't always have like the, their, their top level race shoes. Mm-hmm. And so it sometimes can be, can be difficult, but it, it it's, it, it can be overwhelming, but yeah. if you go into it with a plan kind of like that, I think it, it, it can, it can help. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. I love that plan. And uh, I think I think if people have that sort of um, sort of uh, sort of algorithm to follow to end up with the right shoe, I think that that's a that's the best advice you can give them, because now they're trying different shoes and then ultimately trying to zero in on that one that is comfortable, has the right style, is yeah. protecting them from impact and uh, and then helping with performance. But I wanna I want to circle back to another topic that I know is one of your favorite topics to talk about too. Okay. In that uh, with the running shoe, obviously it, we're talking about protecting from impact. You now need to also work in that recovery. Yeah. And it is so important to treat running as an impact sport, no matter which shoe you're running in. And so once you're done running, you gotta say, you know what, I just did an impact sport. And I got to now spend the time to recover before I run again. Yeah, no, it, it, it's critical. And um, I can tell you how many times I've read the, um, this or heard this in a podcast that there is no such thing as a recovery run. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. Because even a 20 minute run is impact, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say a 20 minute run, hypothetically, I don't know, like you run four kilometers in mm-hmm. 20 minutes. Well, four kilometers is 4,000 steps. That's right. 4,000 impacts at, John, what is it? Two times? Yeah, one and a half to two times your body weight. Yeah. So if you Mm -hmm. weigh 150 pounds, it's 300 pounds Mm -hmm. impact 4,000 times. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not recovery. So John, this is back to you. How do we do a recovery run? We do in the water, right? That's right. That's where I was going to (laughs) go. Our water jogging. Or Um, our body weight support mechanism. Yeah. Or body weight support mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to do it mm-hmm. um, in triathlon. You know, you know, one of the best recovery run is a bike. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, almost everyone I coach has recovery bike rides. Yeah. So it's a spin at a low heart rate. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, it's just to get blood moving to get the it's not even blood, but the, the lymphatic fluids moving. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's lots of evidence for that. Even a recovery swim from a run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think a recovery run is a fallacy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and but I agree with you. Your recovery run in the water now yeah. that's a recovery run or agree. some type of body weight support. I yeah. think that can be a recovery run because you're taking away that impact. And yeah. that impact is uh, the, the driving reason for recovering from a run in terms of, of treating it as a, an impact sport. Or, or a walk. I'm a big either. advocate of running in the water. Or a walk. Yeah, yeah, or walk. Like yeah. A recovery run is a walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, I could not, but it's not necessarily a big hike. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Okay, so I think one other thing that we haven't touched on, maybe we did, uh, is the wear down of the shoe. Well, you mentioned the wear down of the, of the Nike Free shoes. Yeah. But even looking at the shoes and inspecting your shoes, we've talked about this before, I know where I know on my shoe, 
I wear down the lateral rear spot of, of my running shoes and I can see it and I know it's going to happen with every pair of shoes and so I watch for it because I need to change my shoes out before it gets really bad because otherwise once I change out the shoe even if it's the same model same year I'm going to be running differently in those shoes because one has this wedge worn down and the other doesn't. So I, I, I just want to ask you this question because it's, it's kind of fun. Have you ever considered changing the way you run so that that doesn't occur? I think about it all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> I, 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 I even look at my running shoes. I'm like, how am I wearing down the shoes in that spot? It just yeah. makes sense. Because it, it, it I'll be thinking you're going to be landing, like you're going to yeah. be landing really supinated yeah. Yeah. and slapping down quite hard if you're that far out, right? So yeah. you're slapping yeah. down into yeah. pronation and this gets biomechanical, but then you're going to have a big Im impact of internal hip rotation at the exact same time. Right. It, it all goes yeah. up the kinetic That's chain. Right. So I'm like, John, I think we need to bring you into the lab and maybe do a run session with me where I actually just so, to, to fix your running. Well, my running is, unfortunately, my running is not not great anymore. I mean- Because you're landing on the outside of your heel. Like, I know, that's right. <laughs> well, but, you, but it, worked, also, it also speaks it. to the point where I am conscious of it yep. and it is hard to change the way we run. Yep. And what I do advocate though, um to to that point is i tell people to run on different surfaces and i do as well yeah. because what, what is amazing is it's hard to to mentally change the way you run like if you're running you know on your your typical route on a sidewalk or the road or whatever mm -hmm. but the moment you run in grass you are changed the way you run in heartbeat yeah um, instantly like the instantly. first time yeah yeah and so i i do include this uh you know running in grass running on pavement to introduce different ways to run but i still were down the heel in a particular spot but it, it, it is possible to change how you run mm -hmm. i mean people do it all the time right people yeah. uh, move from a, a rear foot strike to a four foot strike to a mid foot strike mm -hmm. if you really are conscious of it and you have a plan yeah. Yeah. Uh, i've changed lots of people's running mm -hmm. um you know, in particular, you know, some of the big running errors, which yeah. I also do want to have a podcast on, is, is talking about the like the, the most typical running errors that mm -hmm. can be actually manipulated yeah. and fixed. You can change. Sure. It's not easy, though. It, it, it takes a lot of effort to be able to do it. And sometimes you're changed for a little bit, but then you gravitate back towards, a, you know, the way that you were running before. But, it, yeah, I mean, it, you know, looking one one easy place to look at with, you know, changes is stride rate and yep. stride length. And and most people need to take a shorter stride length. Uh, most of us do take too long of a stride. But it's so funny when I see people run, you know, when I'm driving around, I see people run and someone's got a really short stride. I'm like, oh, yeah, that person's figured it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right I'm, like, I'm just like, OK, like and then you see some of the people they're taking these huge, long strides. You're like, I mean, that's an injury waiting to happen, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, and, you know, circling back to shoe choice, your shoe choice for one stride length may be very different yeah, than sure. another stride length. So it, you know, this goes back to those factors that influence what shoe is best for a person. It's how you're built, your structures, how you run, your movements, and then also even your running experience and, and type of running that you do. The last thing I want to talk about before we go is when they talked about like, did you have a medical practitioner or a clinician help you? Mm -hmm. And if that was part of it, right, mm -hmm. in the decision. So some some runners will go to a guru. Yeah, that's what we'll call them, mm -hmm. a guru to say, oh, you know, I'm having this issue. Mm -hmm. What shoe should I be in? Yeah. Um, I think you got to be careful with that. Yeah, you do, All right. because you know I, I can speak to even like my program at UNLV. We don't teach that. Mm -hmm. And I know that, um, you, you know, in the physical therapy department, they don't teach this. Mm -hmm. Now, I've personally taken extra classes and learned, and I know there's physical therapists that could take extra classes and learn how to do this. Um, but it is not something that is typically taught in physical therapy school or in mm -hmm. athletic training school. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not taught, um, you know, for a physician. Yeah. This is not something in med school. Um, and just because your doctor is a runner doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to prescribe mm -hmm. certain footwear. 
So I think we have to be very careful when we take somebody that we trust for other reasons, mm -hmm. like a physician, for example, or a physical therapist, or athletic trainer, whoever, and be like, oh, well, they're a runner, so they know. Yeah. Um, there is literally hours long courses on helping people figure out, you know, based off of injury profiling and foot architecture and all of these things, a mm -hmm. shoe that might, that may help them. Yeah. You know, I said may help because it's a, a little small piece. Yeah. The training errors are still the biggest problem, but just be careful. I think in general, when we go to these different gurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and this is where sometimes the structures of the shoe can, can, influence our comfort feeling, but they may actually not be the best thing for us. And, uh, and so, no, I, I agree with you. You've really got to, you got to be careful. Uh, anytime you're, you're adding different structures to the shoe or taking certain structures away, whichever way it is, it's not easy. It, it, this is not an easier to, to, uh, to work operate in. And I'll throw the same thing out for orthotics. Mm-hmm be very careful with when you get orthotics made mm -hmm. if you're a runner that the person that's actually doing this really understands running mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what and understands what actually happens yeah. when you change a major part of the shoe mm -hmm. you're changing the interface between your foot and the shoe and it's been this shoe's been designed not to have that in there right so once again, be very, very careful. Um, John, I, I hate to say, sometimes I cringe when someone's like, oh yeah, I've been in these orthotics for like seven oh, yeah, years. Yeah. I'm like, you've been in orthotics for seven years? Like, yeah. Mm, yeah. and you're still having problems? Yeah. Eee, I just cringe sometimes. And I don't uh, know, there's yeah. good people out there. There's good people out there. I'm, I, I don't want to throw everyone under the bus, but just be careful with who you end up working with that's all i'm saying and one more word of caution that that uh we've we've fell down this path in research and uh have discovered that it really wasn't pertinent is your footprint walking out of the shower driving what type of uh, shoe you should run in it, it doesn't match so if your your footprint is uh such that you see the whole outline of your of your foot versus maybe just a little bit different um that doesn't necessarily drive a shoe decision so yeah another one one other one you saw i'm going to ask you about the, your heel on your shoe okay so this is just you because I, I just want to know is it your right shoe it, what, say it again for you on your heel where your heel wears down is it more on your right than your left um oh well you're catching me uh it's, i'm just wondering no it is different on each side and i think it is more on my right side my right shoe will typically wear down faster than my left side, yeah. On the outside of the heel. Yeah. Hmm. This is once again an anecdote. And, and this, uh, this was on a podcast I listened to. And it was basically somebody talking about this exact same thing. And they found out that the guy that had the issue with the right side, he also drove a lot. Hmm. And he drove in his running shoes. And his, his foot, because like, you're, you're always transitioning between the brake and the, and the yeah, gas, yeah. Yeah. was always on that side. And it actually was, yeah. his running was, was, he wasn't even striking really there. Yeah. It was just, it was breaking yeah. down because he was oh. driving. Well, and I, I yeah, yeah, and I, I only wear my running shoes for running. Yeah, so you're, um, you're not that case, but I was just wondering. But it, no, that, that's actually a really good point, because there are sometimes some other causative factors. Like back in the day, my car was a standard, so I had a clutch. And yep. the clutch was actually quite stiff. And lo and behold, I was having running problems on my left knee, but it wasn't a running problem. It, it was, was a clutch. clutch. <laughs> my clutch was too stiff. And it was just, oh, yeah, that was, uh, so I was actually learning how to shift with my right foot uh, at times. So. so, but I think you bring up a really good point there is oftentimes we blame running for, yeah. Yeah. right? And, and in triathlon, it might not be, it, the running might be what causes the pain, but mm -hmm. the problem might be your setup on the bike. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a too aggressive setup. Maybe the crank length is not optimal for you yeah. or your saddle position. And you're mm -hmm. actually putting stress on a tendon, but you're, but you're, and you're doing maybe some damage to that tendon, but it's not because there's no impact I and mean, you might not feel it on the bike. Mm-hmm. And then you go and run. And once you now you're running on a weakened structure. All right. And then we blame the run. 
Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take some time off of running, but I'm going to cycle more. Mm-hmm. And then they try and go back to running. And it's like, right. well, it didn't get any better. And it's like, well, because the problem actually was the bike. Yeah. And that's yeah. another thing with triathletes is you have to think holistically. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, about these things so uh anyways we could talk for hours about oh this, this is great this is such this, a good this, topic. This, we didn't oh, even oh. finish the, the 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 major points of the of, of the paper but anyways we should go because john's hungry he hasn't had a chance yeah. to, right. and uh my dog just came um and said hey it's time for my night walk yeah yeah there you go so cosmo needs it cosmo needs his night walk cosmo's ready well yeah. this was this is great i think um it, it's a tough topic but I think, you know, if we, if someone walks away and say, knowing that they need to find the best shoe for them, for their body, for their type of racing, for their type of running and comfort is an okay thing to use as a way to pick that shoe and style, yeah. then I think they're, they're walking away with the best that they can do. And so just be patient as you're trying to find that right running shoe. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, John. Have a good uh, weekend of training. Um, and uh, I assume we'll podcast from Arizona next week. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. All awesome. right. Talk okay. soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.